It's our great pleasure to welcome to our 2023 Online Trend Summit, Dr. Kevin Hall, who's a senior investigator at the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, one of the National Institutes of Health in Maryland in the US. And we're going to be exploring and talking about ultra processed foods, what they are, the classification, the randomized control study that Kevin has led, what we know and what we don't know, uh, what this means for the food industry and how we, all of us, can be part of the solution uh, and a better future. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. It's great to welcome you to our virtual stage. Thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, if you're participating in today's summit as a Trend Hub subscriber, you can discover more about the topics covered in this discussion in our 2425 Food and Drink Trends Framework, particularly the two mega trends that for this next year we've called Evolve Smarter and Empowered Self, as, as well as the wider Cuisines, Ingredients and Food Trends Framework on Trend Hub. So without further ado, Kevin, I'm going to hand over to you um, to share um, to share your slides and your and, and your thinking and your work today, and then we'll pick up on some conversation points uh, after that. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation to, to chat with you all today and tell you a bit, little bit about my research and, and some of my thinking on this, this pretty controversial and timely topic these days. Um, you know, I was, I've spent most of my career uh, studying the effects of different macronutrients on the uh, human physiology, how we adapt to lower carbohydrate diets, lower fat diets, what happens inside our bodies and our brains as, as those things uh, change. And so I'm very, I very much came to this uh, field from a sort of nutrient perspective. And, you know, it, it became clear that Others were starting to think a little bit more broadly than the nutrients in our foods as being uh, potentially important for health. Um, one of the first uh, folks that I, I heard uh, kind of criticize, criticize the idea that we should be focusing on nutrients is uh, Georgius Scrinis, who uh, published a book called Nutritionism. In fact, he's you know, kind of, this is a, a derisive term <laughs> in his viewpoint. He says that nutritionism or nutritional reductionism is characterized by the reductive focus on the nutrient composition of the foods as a mean for, means for understanding their healthfulness. And, you know, when I first read that, I thought, well, well yeah, that's kind of what nutrition science is all about. It's about kind of understanding how variations in the nutrient contents of food affect affect health and and risk for different kinds of diseases. Yeah. Um, and this idea was, uh, this criticism was kind of further popularized by the author uh, Michael Pollan, yeah. who in his uh, his book, The In Defense of Food, he, he uh, used this term nutritionism again and defined it as the widely shared but unexamined assumption that the key to understanding food is indeed the nutrient. Put another way, foods are essentially the sum of their nutrient parts. Mm -hmm. And again, that sounds kind of appealing to me. <laughs> and yeah. and yeah. so I was actually kind of confused by this idea that, you know, people were starting to kind of criticize the idea of uh, thinking about foods in terms of their nutrient profile, um, the way that nutrition science has done for, for you know, more than a century now. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of really came to a head uh, when the uh, folks in Brazil, led by Carlos Montero, came up with a uh, way of classifying foods uh, called the NOVA classification system, which basically ignored nutrients altogether mm -hmm. um, and classified foods into one of these different food groups. And I'll, I'll explain them a little bit in a minute. But the really interesting idea here was that the, the idea of classifying foods uh, according to uh, these different groups um, was really kind of moving us away from this idea that nutrients are the most important thing to think about in terms of um, food and its effects on health. And so the, the food groups that, that um, the NOVA classification system uh, groups these things into is uh, one is the unprocessed or minimally processed foods. Um, you can think of these as mostly whole foods or, you know, every, almost every food is processed in some degree. So you, mm -hmm. you wash something that's processed. Yeah. So uh, so that the idea here is that it's the, kind of the edible parts of plants and animals after separation of nature and preserved by minimal processes. Uh, and then Group two is the processed culinary ingredients. The way I like to think about these, uh, this category is that these are the things that you don't um, eat on their own. Uh, nobody is walking around guzzling olive oil as a beverage or, or eating sticks of butter um, for a snack. 
or pouring themselves a bowl of sugar. Um, so these are the things that are combined with um, minimally processed foods from group one in order to make uh, kind of dishes or meals or, or other kinds of foods, things that might be grouped into category three processed foods. That's group one foods modified with the addition of group two foods yeah. uh, aiming at uh, food preservation or enhancement of its sensory qualities. Things like freshly baked breads, different kinds of cheeses, canned and jarred um, uh, uh, produce and things like that, or even pasta that you that might you might make. So um, these are the kind of the first three categories. And then you could almost think of anything else that doesn't belong in those first three categories might be um, the category four. And in fact, uh, but they, they actually do share a definition here for what are now called ultra processed foods. And the idea here is that these are now formulations of several ingredients that include originally or chemically modified food substances obtained by the fractioning of whole foods and additives to make the final product palatable or hyper palatable. And the aim is to make convenient and low cost products uh, liable to replace all other food groups. And you can see the kind of typical junk foods that are listed here on the right uh, in, in the examples. Um, and of course, according to the, the NOVA categorization system, the idea is that categories one through three um, are sort of deemed to be, you know, helpful and, and not limited necessarily in terms of uh, intake, whereas category four are the bad guys, the ultra processed foods that are, that are thought to be particularly um, uh, related to chronic diet related diseases. Mm -hmm. Now, in this classification system came out, I don't know that there was great data supporting the idea that ultra processed foods were associated with poor health. Um, but the thing that the, the idea here was that these foods are kind of being created from relatively cheap ingredients of commodity crops like uh, soy and, and corn and wheat that can be grown at very large scales um, uh, through industrial agriculture. And uh, with great yields and, and uh, beneficial properties in terms of providing many, many calories and a lot of protein. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that, you know, these foods uh, or these commodity crops can be turned into the wide variety of, of, of ultra processed foods that we find in our supermarkets. And uh, this is just a, an example of a, of, a, uh, of a convenience store in, uh, well, not a convenience store, I guess a supermarket in, in the U.S. here. Mm -hmm. Um, so the idea of ultra processed food, you know, it, it took me a little while to kind of think about how to put together this definition. And I, I, I'm still struggling with it, to be honest with you. But this is a diagram that I, I put together to try to understand what this uh, Nova 4 group is all about. And so the way I like to think of it is, you know, you're taking whole foods, you're deconstructing. And I, I would argue that, you know, the wheat and the corn and the, uh, the soy are whole foods and you're deconstructing and modifying those ingredients, purifying them in some sense, um, kind of making them into uh, ingredients that you are then going to use and in combination with various other additives and preservatives through a variety of industrial processing methods. And then you'll finally come up with a product. Um, but NOVA Category 4 is not just about the product per se. It's also discussing the purpose of that product. And the idea, again, is that it's the combination of that product and all of those ingredients and preservatives and additives and the, and the industrial processing that goes into making the product um, to make the foods convenient, inexpensive, palatable, profitable, and um, displace uh, foods from the diet that are in NOVA categories one through three. So there's this combination of the actual product itself and the processing that goes in and the ingredients and the additives and preservatives, along with the purpose that defines ultra processed foods. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's interesting. It's, it's It certainly doesn't discuss nutrients at all. So it's kind of an orthogonal way to think about food. Um, and and it's uh, it's certainly not in my comfort zone when I first heard about it, um, but it it's it's something that has become very popular. And the the thing that's really interesting is that since this definition and since this uh, concept has been introduced, there has been literally more than a thousand different um, nutritional epidemiology studies linking. Uh, increased consumption of ultra processed foods with a whole host of chronic diet related diseases, even all cause mortality. Mm -hmm. And so the message here is that, you know, the public health researchers are saying, you know, ultra processed foods are really bad news. 
-hmm. We know that we have uh, countries like the U.S. and the U.K., you know, really terrible levels of chronic diet related disease that are costing, you know, huge sums of money um, and, and huge uh, taking a huge toll on the health of our populations. And uh, over and over again, high intake of ultra processed foods, which are now, you know, more than 50 percent of the food supplies in, in countries like the U.S. and the U.K. Um, are associated with uh, those uh, those um, those poor health conditions. Mm -hmm. And so what we have now is this basically this battle that <laughs> seems to be taking place between big public health and big food. And I just kind of taken a few quotations just to illustrate the tenor of this. Yeah. Um, there was a paper that came out in the BMJ very recently, um, and they basically advocate, they say existing evidence is sufficiently strong to warrant immediate public health actions to help citizens identify ultra processed foods and limit their exposure. Mm -hmm. and, and on the other side, uh, there's a lot of pushback from um, organizations that are, are are associated with the food industry. So, for example, Food Drink Europe says that ultra processed food classifications are illogical and contradict the scientific evaluation of food. So we shouldn't yeah. even be considering them science. And the North American Meat Institute, in a comment to the uh, U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, said that, you know, the scientific evaluation of the role of ultra processed food and health outcomes is premature. Uh, right. basically advocating that the uh, dietary guidelines for Americans should should not even really be considering uh, mm -hmm. ultra processed foods in in uh, making its recommendations. Um, so where does that leave us? I mean, it you know, I mentioned this before, we've we're experiencing this increase in the um, availability of calories uh, that are categorized as ultra processed foods. We're cooking less and less, so therefore we're, we're purchasing less and less culinary ingredients. Um, and along with these sorts of trends, uh, we're seeing increases in various uh, chronic diet-related diseases, one of which is obesity, which is mm -hmm. you know, one of my particular interests. Yeah. And so what I'm showing here is just in the U.S. since the 1970s, the average U.S. adult body weight has gone up by you know, about 12 kilos. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a huge increase in average body weight, and the prevalence of obesity has skyrocketed. Yeah. And so I'm very interested in mechanisms and the physiology. Mm -hmm. And so when I sort of heard about ultra processed foods and you know what's, uh, what's potentially driving obesity, um, I asked the folks who introduced me to this concept, you know, what is it about ultra processed foods that you think is causing obesity? After all, there've been link after link in these different um, nutritional epidemiolo epidemiological uh, analyses. Mm -hmm. And the answer that I got was, well, they're really high in salt, sugar, and fat, and they're low in fiber. And of course, those are nutrients. So I was very interested, is there a nutrient independent effect um, of ultra processed foods on, uh, on weight gain? Mm -hmm. And so we designed a randomized control trial here at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center, where we had 20 men and women come and live with us um, for uh, a month continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we basically took over their food environment. So in one case, people were randomized to receive two weeks of an ultra processed diet that was 80% of calories coming from uh, Nova category four foods, mm -hmm. or they were randomized to two weeks of an unprocessed diet where 80% of calories came from category one Nova foods and 0% ultra processed foods. And we basically just told these folks to eat as much or as little as they like, um, that they're, it's not a weight gain study, it's not a weight loss study. We're just interested in how these different foods affect their bodies. They were blinded to all their measurements. Uh, they didn't know what the uh, primary outcome of the study was, but what they didn't know is that you know, we were providing them with double the number of calories that they would need to maintain their weight asking them to eat just as much or as little as they wanted. And what they didn't know is that we were weighing their leftovers and, and okay. calculating exactly yeah. what they ate and how much um, they, were, they were consuming on these different diets. So for two weeks, they were assigned to one of these two diets and then uh, immediately thereafter, we swapped them. So everybody's acting as their own control. They're yeah. both getting both diets, either an ultra processed diet or an unprocessed diet. And our, our dietitians and chefs at the clinical center here at the NIH are really talented. And I gave them these kind of crazy instructions to try to match the calories that we presented to people, the carbs, the fat, 
the overall energy density, that's the calories per gram of, of the meals that we were presenting, match the sodium, match the fiber, match the sugars, and uh, but will vary hugely in the amount of energy coming from ultra-processed food. Like I said, more than 80% in the ultra-processed uh, uh, diet and, and more than 80% from uh, minimally processed foods in the unprocessed diet. And so what I was interested in was if we actually matched for these nutrients of concern, the, the, the fat, the sugar, the, uh, the salt, and the fiber, uh, would we see any difference in the number of calories that people chose to eat on these different diets? Yeah. And so they reported the same degree of hunger, the same amount of fullness, the same amount of satisfaction and eating capacity. So they were doing as they were told, eating as much or as little as they wanted. And to my great surprise, despite matching for all of those nutrients of concern, during the time period that they were on the ultra processed diet, they ate a little more than 500 calories per day, more on average than when the same people were exposed to the unprocessed diet. And that was translated into about a kilo of weight gain during the period of time that they were on the ultra processed diet and about a kilo of weight loss during the period of time that they were on the unprocessed diet and correspondingly changes in their body fat. So they're increasing their body fat, they're getting fatter when they're eating the ultra processed diet and losing body fat when they were on uh, the unprocessed diet. Um, so, so that was really surprising to me. I mean, it caused a little bit of a splash. And uh, this ends up being a little bit of a, an inkblot test because we don't really know what the mechanism is um, by which people chose to eat so many more calories on the ultra processed diet, spontaneously gaining weight and gaining body fat. And when the same folks were given a diet that was uh, minimally processed, 0% of calories from um, NOVA category four, they spontaneously lost weight and lost body fat. There are no shortage of hypotheses about what the mechanism here is. Um, I've had more sort of conversations with scientists around the world with their own pet hypothesis about explaining our data, thinking no matter how certain they are that <laughs> they, they can explain what we've seen, they are at this point just hypotheses. Um, but what we've done is gone back and taken a look at our data and tried to assess, you know, what were some of the characteristics of the meals mm -hmm. that we provided to people on these different diets that could potentially explain this effect and then use that information to design a new study, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Yeah. So one of the things that we did was we uh, went back and looked at the, uh, the composition of the meals. And um, using a, a new definition, which again, this is even newer than the ultra processed food definition, uh, a, food, a definition called hyperpalatable food, which uh, was coined by Tara Fazino at University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, a, a hyperpalatable food is defined by pairs of nutrient thresholds cross uh, pairs of nutrients crossing certain thresholds. So if a, a food, an individual food is high in sugar and fat. Um, or it's high in uh, fat and salt, or it's high in carbs and salt, it would be deemed hyperpalatable. And one of the things that we noticed was that even though we matched for those nutrients overall in the diets, we ended up presenting people with more hyperpalatable foods on the ultra processed diet. And when we did a mediation analysis, we discovered that uh, about you know, a little over 40% of the effect of ultra processed versus unprocessed um, uh, meals was mediated by so-called hyperpalatable food. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we noted was that the energy density of the overall meals was um, was matched between the the the, uh, the two diet test diets that we used in our study. But uh, in one case, the ultra processed diet had many more beverages that we were dissolving fiber supplements. And when we removed the beverages and asked just about the the meals themselves, it turned out that the uh, meals had higher non beverage energy density. And that non beverage energy density also um, mediated about forty percent of the effect of the ultra processed versus minimally processed diets. And so what we've done now is we've uh, have a new study underway here at the clinical center, where again, people are staying with us for a month 
um, in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we have now four test diets um, provided for one week each in randomized counterbalance sequence. The first diet is very similar to our original un unprocessed diet. It's, and it's low in non-beverage energy density and low in hyperpalatable foods. Mm -hmm. um, the second diet is very similar to our original uh, ultra processed diet. It's high in non beverage energy density and high in hyper palatable foods. And then we have two reformulated ultra processed diets w one that is high in non beverage energy density, but low in hyper palatable foods. And the other is low in non beverage energy density and low in hyper palatable foods. Right. All four of these diets are matched for the salt, sugar, fat, fiber, glycemic load, energy density, um, and, and well, not energy density overall, but, um, but, uh, the salt, sugar, fat, and fiber, and protein. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we basically are trying to tease apart the independent effects of non-beverage energy density and hyperpalatable foods in driving the effects of overconsumption and, uh, and changes in body weight. Yeah. Um, and so that's a study that's ongoing right now at the clinical center. We have a couple of subjects in. Uh, we do all of our studies here at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. Um, it looks like this. It's a big red brick building just across the way. And um, this is what our metabolic ward looks like. It's basically a hospital ward. And this is where um, our subjects spend, you know, a month of their lives, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, kind of uh, basically hanging out here. They can go walk outside for a period of time, but only under supervision of our research staff. Um, and we can basically, because of this facility, we can really just take complete control over the foods that these people are exposed to. But as you can see, it's a pretty artificial environment. Yeah. And we only have a limited number of beds available for our study. So we can only house two people at a time. Mm -hmm. So it takes a very long time for us to, to run these studies. Um, and there's, you know, there's no real need for that. <laughs> which is kind of interesting, right? You you don't have to have people in a hospital environment. You could move them out to some rural environment where, again, you can have complete control over their food environment. And it might be a little bit of a nicer experience to stay in, uh, you know, basically like a hotel room yeah. uh, for a period of time. And this is actually a, a retreat center in rural Virginia where we're hoping to do some future studies where we don't have to study just two people at a time, but can study, you know, 20 to 40 people mm -hmm. at a time. And yeah. instead of taking years to answer these questions, we could potentially answer these questions uh, in a matter of a month or two. Yeah. Um, so that's for the future. And that really brings me to the, to the end of the, the talk, because I think what we really want to um, emphasize here is that we really need a substantial investment in ultra processed food research. When we were talking about that, you know, dichotomy between the big public health and big mm. uh, and, and big food, it seems like on one side, people are saying we already have enough information to, to basically um, to act, act now. And yeah. the other side is saying, you know what, the, we don't really have enough information to do anything. What is lacking is a real call for a substantial investment in research to figure out what's going on. Because I think the epidemiological evidence linking ultra processed foods with poor health is, is a cause for great concern. They dominate yeah. the food supply in many countries. Um, they're increasing in other countries. Chronic diet related diseases are increasingly prevalent and extraordinarily costly. A recent um, analysis uh, calculated it's annually about 9% of the GDP in the USA it goes towards um, uh, chronic diet related diseases, which have been linked um, um, through the epidemiology with ultra processed food consumption. And I think that if we really understood the mechanisms that linked ultra processed foods to chronic diet related diseases, this would be extremely helpful. Uh, we could provide actionable guidance to both industry in terms of reformulation and policymakers for regulation to, to improve the food environment and really, really just kind of push the needle on on the public health as well as as uh, helping industry make better um, better products now lots of you reference lots of kind of hypotheses um in your in your presentation and i suppose some of the questions that i want to ask you may not have the exact <laughs> the answers to but right really interesting <laughs> to hear your sort of thoughts on some of them and the very the very notion of ultra processed i noted that on you know on your third slide when you went through the nova um uh, classification obviously the word processing comes up time and time again and 
in the, the work that you've done, how much of it, how much of, in your view, the you know, the, the the causal link between these these food groups and um, ill health is around the the processing bit as opposed to the ingredients themselves. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the things that we just don't know the answer to. In other words, yeah. some of the processing might be changing the texture of the food, which might yeah. be changing how you know quickly it's eaten, digested and absorbed. It might be changing um, the food, the food matrix itself, which you know takes the cellular structure and breaks it apart and makes these nutrients more readily digestible and, and absorbed in different parts of the intestine, which could cause changes in the you know gut brain axis. Again, there's all sorts of hypotheses that are bi biologically quite plausible linking the processing per se yeah. to um, excess calorie intake. But then there's all sorts of other, you know, ingredients, right? Or the nutrient composition of, of, the, of the foods, which, you know, people um, who advocate for the use of ultra processed foods also acknowledge that, yeah, there's a large fraction of them that are high in salt and sugar and saturated fat and low mm -hmm. in fiber and low in protein, and that those are potentially important contributors as well. So I, again, it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem. We don't know what the drivers of these associations are. Yeah, and 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 that, that's one of the things I wanted, and obviously you've touched on in your presentation, but to, just to bring a, a little bit of clarity to to the question around what are the things that we that we know with some confidence, and what are the things that we don't know at the moment? I mean, I think the thing that we know is that by whatever mechanism, the epidemiology is just unbelievably overwhelming, right? There's just so many studies that have linked ultra processed food consumption with a whole host of poor health conditions as well as all cause mortality. Really, especially kind of striking given the fact that ultra processed foods already make up a huge swath of the food supply. I mean, if it was 100% of the food supply, of course, you would not be able to detect any signal because everybody would be eating all ultra processed foods. So the fact that they're still able to detect, you know, substantial increased risk, yeah. given that were a wash in this stuff already is yeah. it, it suggests to me that there's something going on yeah. if is it, is it one thing that's going on i don't know i mean how much of the effect could be like let's imagine that we know that obesity um, is also associated with you know increased risk for type 2 diabetes increased asthma risk increased mm -hmm. risk for cardiovascular disease for various forms of cancer how much of the effect of ultra processed foods is downstream of obesity mm -hmm. and then how much of the obesity effect is downstream of um, some of these uh, factors like energy density or hyper palatable foods or some of these other things that we just talked about like how quickly the nutrients are digested and absorbed and how that might change the gut brain axis for yeah. example yeah we've i guess touched on this in your presentation illustrates the fact that the classification that defines ultra processed food is to some extent quite rudimentary do you see a, a um the need for or the or i guess the evolution you know spinning out of that classification um i, I guess a sub classification that brings a greater level of sophistication to ultra processed foods and the types of them. And I suppose you've started to illustrate that with the, this term hyper palatable. I sort of see, you know, even though I think that the ultra processed food category was introduced um, as even before there was great evidence that this was the bad guy, right? I sort of just view the Nova categorization system. Let's like, let's remove the, you know, the, the connotations associated with it. This is an orthogonal way to think about foods. It, it, I like the idea that it doesn't uh, talk about nutrients at all, because that means that we can then subcategorize ultra processed foods or any of the other NOVA categories in terms of their nutrient profiles, right? So it, what this is suggesting is that nutrient profiles are not the be all and end all of, of how to think about foods. But I also think that, you know, level and purpose of processing is also not the be all and end all. And, and if we understood the mechanisms by which ultra processed foods are linked to chronic diet related diseases, then we could start to subclassify, whether that's a nutrient based subclassification, yeah. which is certainly possible, or another 
um, subclassification based on you know particular processes that might be harmful or particular ingredients that are not nutrients that might be harmful. Um, I think that that's the way to go. But until we really understand what those mechanisms are, um, I think we're we're basically left with plausible hypotheses. Yeah. And and we really need the research and urgent investment in the research to kind of start to figure this out, because if we don't, then we run the risk of enacting ineffective policies yeah. or reformulating in ways that are not addressing the problem. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And depending on the, ge the geography and also depending on um, socioeconomic status, which is also a factor, um, we could be looking at anywhere between sort of 50 and 80 percent of diet in some uh, in, in some groups. Is your instinct that it is about total elimination of these food groups or moderation of consumption, do you feel? From the perspective of almost anything in public health and almost anything in physiology, there's a dose response. Right. So <laughs> these are not all or nothing things. Yeah. And, and sometimes the dose response can be quite steep. Uh, but but more often than not, there's um, there's some dose response, and we just don't know what that is. Yeah, um, I, I've purposefully been using very high ultra processed diets versus none. Yes. Uh, in order to try to get at what the what the effect sizes are that we're talking about, and yeah. you know, in our hands we see very large effect sizes in in you know, five hundred plus calories per day on average and yeah. and you know big changes in body weight and over very short periods of time in people that aren't trying to do anything right they're just eating as much or as little as they want yeah. um, what the dose response looks like i think is is an interesting question but again we're just the, the mechanistic research and investigating those things is just really in its infancy right yeah. now yeah yeah that feels like it's a, qu a question for you need to do the next piece of work to then start looking at uh, degrees of um, you know, percentages of consumption of ultra processed. Right. Yeah, we, we have done another study, a very similar design to the randomized control trial that we completed already, where we chose two diets that were relatively low in ultra processed foods around, you know, 20 to 30%. Mm -hmm. um, and again, asked people to eat as much or as little as they wanted. And we still saw big differences in energy intake, but both groups tended to lose weight. <laughs> So it's just that one lost more weight than the other. Um, yeah, and absolutely. given that most of the folks are coming into our study are eating, you know, probably 50% ultra processed foods, both of those diets were lower in ultra processed foods and both yeah, led yeah. to weight loss. Yeah. So it suggests that, you know, maybe there, if, if the dose effect is, you know, on that 20 to 30% is maybe not so bad, um, yeah. depending on, again, depending on what those ultra processed foods are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, that is at least one little data point in the middle there that, that we can share. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really, that's really interesting, actually. Because we have RDAs, recommended daily allowances for a plethora of different um uh, macronutrients do you see a world where we'll end up with an rda for ultra processed foods or or a or a i guess a subclassification of ultra processed foods I, yeah i mean either we're going to figure this out and from a mechanistic perspective and it's either going to be I, my my view is that if we can figure out from a mechanistic perspective the idea of ultra processed foods is is going to basically have pointed us to some important mechanisms that we can then take forward. But um, but the idea that we still classify things as ultra processed and therefore bad will not be part of it. In other words, there's it seems to me that even though that may have been the original intent of the NOVA categorization system, mm -hmm. um, there's probably perfectly healthy ultra processed foods um, and and there's probably perfectly unhealthy ultra processed foods as well. And until we understand the mechanisms, we don't know how to differentiate them. Right. Um, and I think that that's the path forward really is to kind of use this as, you know, there's some really important signal here that we didn't, that we didn't necessarily see before. Um, and one of the kind of pushbacks against the NOVA categorization system has been, well, you know, this is just telling us what we already knew that the things yeah. that were high in fat you know, salt and uh, and sugar are the, the main culprits. But interestingly, I, I have not been able to find a single epidemiological study linking uh, 
high fat, sugar, and salt foods to poor health. You know, there's more than a thousand on That's, UPF. Yeah. We've got I'm lots of, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've got lots of studies linking, you know, sodium intake to, to blood pressure and, and poor cardiovascular disease, but not diets high in these kinds of foods. Yeah. Um, at least I'm not aware of any, right? Yeah. I mean, it's already, how do you define a, a diet that's high in salt, sugar, and, and, and fat? Um, there's various different competing nutrient profiling systems. Mm -hmm. um, they, they probably list different thresholds. And um, this is another common pushback against ultra processed foods is that there's no universally agreed upon definition. I'd argue there's no universally agreed upon yeah. definition of a high fat, salt, sugar yeah. <laughs> food. And there's certainly no data that I'm aware of linking diets that are high in salt, sugar, and fat um, foods defined by some nutrient profiling system with poor health. Yeah. One of the things I was going to ask you that there's a, 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 been a huge amount of discussion and debate in the UK around HFSS foods and yep. proposed legislation and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and one of my questions was, is HFSS and ultra processed foods just one in the, the same thing or, or, or not? Or is there some degree of overlap? I mean, there's certainly big, a big overlap, right? Yeah. That, there's no doubt about that. There's a huge overlap, um, it, but it's not one to one. No. And there are certainly ultra processed foods that are not high in salt, sugar and fat. And I, I tend to try to eat you know, of the ultra processed foods I try to, to, to eat for lunch and things like that, that are convenient and tasty and, yeah. and uh, relatively inexpensive, they tend to be not high in salt, sugar and fat. Um, but, but the presumption being that those are the main drivers, I mean, there have been um, some attempts in these epidemiological studies to um, basically adjust for the salt, sugar, fat, um, and even fiber and trying to kind of tease apart whether or not there's still an effect of ultra processed high diets, high in ultra processed foods. Once you adjust for those nutrients yeah. Yeah. of concern in the same way that we try to control those nutrients of concern at the level of the overall diet. And we still saw an effect. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that there's, again, there's probably some important data there that we need to to, to get um, to uncover, but I don't think we've got it. I don't think we can just wave our hands and say, oh, all of the effect of ultra processed mm -hmm. foods is because of HFSS foods. No. And do you think, and you, you, you've started to touch on it just a couple of moments ago, in, in your view, can we have healthy or better for you ultra processed foods? And if, if there are any, what might some examples be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are. I, I think that there's, I mean, like I said, I, I typically on a, over the five days a week, I tend to bring in a, you know, frozen lunch uh, with my, and invariably it's even no matter how much, you know, healthy whole grains and vegetables that, that it has in it um, and, and lots of fiber and whatnot, there's just the food technology required to make that product heat up well in a microwave yeah. and is going to make it have some things in it that are going to deem it ultra processed. Yeah. Um, I would be shocked if those foods are bad for me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they might be, I don't know, but yeah. I'd be shocked. Right. So, um, so I think that, again, the idea is to not necessarily use all the negative connotations with ultra processed food, but if we really understood the mechanisms, then it would be clear that, huge categories of food are actually probably really good for you and and are still convenient and inexpensive and um, have you know all the important properties that we love about those foods at the same time i think that when you're coming from a perspective of a country like the us and the uk that are already awash in ultra processed foods it would be very very difficult to reduce them to the sort of 20 percent level yeah. Right. But countries like Brazil and Latin America and places where it's really still at that very low level, you know, I can understand, I can sympathize with the idea of, well, we don't want to become a wash in these yeah. kinds of foods. We don't yeah. want to change our food culture dramatically to make it more Americanized or, or yeah. whatever. Um, and so the policies might be very different in places like that than they are in the UK and the US.
a slightly, I guess, a, a controversial question or proposition for you. We're uh, in, in many parts of the world still in the midst of a cost of living uh, crisis where food is far more expensive than it was a year ago and definitely more than a couple of years ago. There's a question around affordability and, and there is perhaps a perspective that the demonization of ultra processed foods is just a luxury that the world can't afford to embrace right now. Um, how do you feel about that? It's one of the things I've been trying to be very careful about in our publications is that, um, you know, there's there are very good reasons why ultra processed foods have become very popular and and have allowed for changes in society that, you know, we don't require a single member of our household anymore. Yeah. Traditionally women to basically spend a huge portion of their day, you know, essentially preparing food for the family. Yeah. Um, the convenience and the just kind of from an acute food safety perspective um, it, and the fact that you don't require a lot of equipment or skills to prepare these foods, um, and you don't require that time to prepare the foods that you would um, in the past. There's no sort of utopian past where you know everyone had their own personal chef and were making every you know, freshly grown fruits and vegetables in their backyard and um, had that ability. So you know that's a fantasy to think that we're going to go to a place like that. Uh, it'd be great, <laughs> but I, I don't foresee everybody having that sort of wherewithal. Yeah. And so the question is. You know, what do we do to kind of um, move forward from here to both address the, um, the you know, the priv those who are very privileged right now who do have that ability? I have little problem saying, yeah, sure. It seems like there's a signal here between high intake of ultra processed foods. If you have the wherewithal and the, the, the energy and commitment and the privilege to be able to avoid these yeah. foods and you, the interest in doing that, go for it, right? It's not, it's probably not going to damage your health to avoid ultra processed yeah. foods. But for the vast majority of, of us who are, you know, even though the cost of food has gone down as a, as a fraction of our disposable incomes, you know, over the past century, um, in, in most industrialized places, it's still yeah. for many people, a huge cost. Yeah. And, um, and the fact that we have convenient uh, foods that are safe and yeah. uh, is, is, I think, it'd be much worse situation if that wasn't the case, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We have to figure out a, a, a reasonable path forward. Yeah, and that, I suppose that leads me on to my my final question, really, which is that this forum. This summit is all about inspiring and informing industry. And I think given the information that's available now, what should industry do to be part of the solution in the in the face of all of this backlash that's going on um, at the moment? Uh, what, yeah, how do they get involved and be part of the a better future, I suppose? Um, yeah, I think that the current path has not been particularly useful, which has been, oh, we should just more or less go along with business as usual, that this idea of ultra processed foods is unscientific. There's no evidence that everything is processing. Ultra processing is no different than other levels of processing, that um, you know, there's no scientific basis upon which to make any, basically the message being there's nothing to see here. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that there's, probably a lot to see here and that we should be investing in the research to actually figure out what these mechanisms are. If you if you want to be serious about making a difference and improving um, the healthfulness of your products and improving how you know industry is being portrayed as a player as a part as opposed to just an opponent in this process, yeah. I think we need to come up with creative ways to to actually do this research and support it in a, in a way that is avoids conflicts of interest, avoids yeah. um, the perception these negative perceptions. But you know, we're one lab doing this research. There just aren't that many researchers in this area yet, um, and I think we need more people doing better trials. Yeah. We need um, we need to really invest in this because, I, like I said, I think if we can figure this out, there's going to be a win win yeah. for both industry yeah. and the public health folks. Yeah. 
because they'll know what to target. They'll know what things to regulate. Uh, policymakers will know how to regulate around the really problematic areas and the industry will be able to figure out how to make their products better. Yeah. No, most, and and if if there are people within uh, the audience today listening that want to get involved in that, how do they how do they do that? Do they reach out to you. I I'd be happy to talk with anybody about this. We have um, you know we have different ways of funding research at the NIH. Uh, we don't accept industry money directly, um, but there are foundations through which um, you know we can set up the appropriate you know chinese walls and and yeah. develop other ways of doing this and and it's not just me that's doing this research right so there's lots of people yeah. but um but yeah i guess to really answer these questions i think that there's some fundamental facilities that we need i kind of alluded to that at the end yeah. we're making slow progress given the facilities that we have but um but being able to do this kind of really controlled research and domiciled people where we can take complete control of their food environment and really accurately measure what they're eating and see what the effects of the diets are, as opposed to just diet advice, for example, yeah. is I think really critical. And I think a lot could be done here. Yeah. And you're obviously the um, the second um, study that you talked through, that's obviously underway currently. And correct. And and when when do you expect on the current trajectory to get some um, meaningful outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, it's 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 a long slog because we can only keep two or three people at most at a time uh, mm -hmm. on the trial, and each of them are spending a month. Yeah. So it's it's um, to kind of get to even the modest number of people that will study in this trial. It's going to take probably another eight to ten months. Yeah. Um, just to kind of get that minimum number of people. Yeah. Um, and again, it's like it's there's no fundamental reason that has to be the case. And the amount of research that's needed, um, we can't rely on doing it this way. No. And we also can't rely on just um, the way many nutritional uh, st science is, is done, which is kind of basically providing people with a advice on what foods to eat or even providing just the foods and letting them kind of go about their daily. We really do have to domicile people and take over their food environment and 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 um, give them only access to the study foods. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I, I'm, I really hope that that there's a uh, there's there's funding and a mechanic to be able to to speed that process up. But certainly we would very much love to for you to come back and to talk about um perhaps at the next summit or on a podcast or something like that um the the findings from the study that um the that, that um that you're conducting and you know be happy to. that um can uh, you know the ex expedite the uh, progression of that but um i feel like i could talk to you all day kevin if i'm honest um, <laughs> um hugely interesting um topic area very very topical for everybody um in the in the virtual room today and something that is the answers to those questions are going to fundamentally shape the food and drink landscape uh into the future but on um, I'd like to thank you from all of us at The Food People and our 2023 Summit audience for sharing your expertise, your knowledge, your wisdom, your hypotheses and findings uh, and helping us kind of debunk our ultra processed foods and at least give us some pointers and some signals as to what the uh, future uh, could look like. And, uh, yeah, I guess we all abate, wait with bated breath to hear what the uh, findings of the next study are. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thanks very much, Charles.